So welcome back to our podcast, everyone. We are coming to you from different locations today. This is a podcast that usually is is uh, recorded at our church building upstairs in a little podcast uh, studio that we've set up. But today you'll see a very different situation. Matt and Josh, why are you wherever you are? What's going on today? Yeah, we're in Niagara Falls and uh, our fellowship of churches, the Fellowship of Evangelical Baptist Churches of Canada. We're having our national convention here in Niagara Falls this week. And uh, so we're speaking about uh, truth and a shift in culture. We're mm. being spoken to uh, through God's word by the ser- his servant, Dr. Rick Reed, and uh, having a great time here just worshiping and learning and uh, dealing with some important fellowship business as well with, uh, I don't know how many people are here, but quite a few hundred from all across the country. Yeah. Yeah. So for those that maybe are watching this podcast and don't know, the Fellowship of Evangelical Baptist Churches in Canada is a group, denomination, fellowship of over 500 churches right across our nation, almost every province represented there. And uh, so it just happens to be that the the conference is in Niagara Falls this year, nice and close to home. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't happen to go to that conference this time. I could have, but other things keeping me in the church. So that's why I'm not with you guys today. But but anyways, thank you for coming in from, I guess, your hotel room, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If we look past the laptop, we can see the falls through the window. Oh, well, yeah. At least you're not podcasting from the casino. That's a good call. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good call. That's good. Hey, we are today, we are in uh, First Peter once again, First Peter chapter 3. Um, thank you, Pastor Josh, for preaching through that text just a couple days ago. And uh, as you promised in your message, we want to dig a little more technically into the text today. There's some big topics, hot topics here that on a surface level are a little bit hard to understand. And uh, so so thank you for encouraging us to dig a little more deeply this morning into what uh, you were speaking about and what God wants to teach to us. So the first question comes from verses 19 and 20 of 1 Peter 3. Friends, if you have your Bible, look with me. I'll just read those two verses, and then we'll ask the official first question. Verse 19 says, After being made alive, he went and made proclamation, that's Christ, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. So there's all kinds of things there, but the first question is just about that phrase, made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits what's going on there yeah yeah that's a that's a difficult uh little few words and uh wayne grudem in his commentary on first peter he spends about almost 40 pages dealing with those two verses walking you through five potential views making the case for his own he does a good job um my view actually doesn't fully align with his. I, I see the reasons for his and everything else, but uh, but he does a great job just helping you think through the questions you've got to ask about that. Uh, essentially, um, there are, you know, there's a, there's a real handful of, of good views, but they basically boil down to this. Uh, either uh, it is Christ between his death and his resurrection, uh, descending to some form of the place of the dead. And some will say, well, that's hell. Some will say that's a, a purgatory. Or some would say that's um, a common place of the dead, as we talked about the righteous dead and the unrighteous dead, separated by a chasm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you got to say, okay, and he's there and he's proclaiming. Uh, who's he proclaiming to and what's the message he's proclaiming? Um, some have said, well, maybe he's proclaiming opportunity opportunity for repentance for those people who died before he came and didn't have a chance or those people who died so many wiped out in the flood. And he's saying, here I am, I'm the Messiah. Will you believe in me and repent? Um, that would be really nice, but it doesn't fit with the rest of scripture. Mm. And so actually it wouldn't be nice because it would cause us problems with other things, wouldn't it? Uh, it would, it would have to, uh, yeah, it would. It, it just wouldn't fit with what God has said. So remember, we said the principle is use what's clear in the t- passage proper and in the whole of Scripture to make sense of what's cloudy. And what's clear is the Bible says things like it has been appointed unto man once to die and then to face the judgment. Uh, when we die, judgment follows and there's not opportunity for repentance following our death. That's part of the reason it's so urgent to get the gospel to people and give them a chance to believe. Uh, so that view doesn't really make sense, but mm. it's a view some people have held. 
Um, another view would be to say, no, no, but Christ did descend into this realm of the dead, and he did proclaim this message, and, and whether it's across the chasm or whatever it would be, and there the then the message he would be proclaiming, some would say uh, he is proclaiming victory to who? Who are the disobedient spirits that uh, are imprisoned? Well, some would say that might be the fallen angels from the time of the, the flood narrative. And mm -hmm. uh, it talks about the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were beautiful and they took them and they... The Nephilim? And, uh, that's right. And so that's been understood uh, by many to be, these are fallen angels. Um, and so with that view, if that was your view of Genesis, then you make sense of First Peter and you say, well, he's, he's preaching to them. He's, he's preaching to those fallen angels, those spirits that were disobedient long ago are now imprisoned. Um, and then others would say he's preaching to the people who were disobedient at that time. Um, and and I think either of those could make sense to me. Now, you know, I, I would view the Genesis narrative, and to me it, it seems to indicate, I lean towards the side of those are probably fallen angels, I think, the, the sons of God that take the daughters of man. Uh, so I say, okay, that, that makes great sense. But again, he's, he's, he's preaching to the disobedient. And what is he preaching? Uh, victory. That's And that's where I taught and, and landed. Yeah. Um, there is one other view that Augustine held. Uh, Grudem is advancing, and it's proven to be pretty popular. It's, it's making a real surgence in uh, recent years. Um, and that is that perhaps it's saying that Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, was preaching through Noah, repent. And there is like a, a, a gospel victory before hmm. the fullness of the gospel. But of hmm. course, the New Testament points to the gospel and that he's preaching this, you know, repent and find salvation in God. Um, and that that's Christ by the Holy Spirit through Noah. To show you how that could happen and how that can make reasonably good sense, good sense even, uh, we would have to get very technical into what's written here in the Greek, and, and there's lots of different potential ways to translate some of these words, and we, we won't do that again for the sake of the podcast. I, I think it is, uh, it's a plausible theory of what First Peter could mean. Um, the reason I don't hold to it is simple. I think when we read scripture, we should most frequently take what seems to be the most natural reading of the text. Hmm. And it seems to me the most natural reading of the text is that Jesus went to the realm of the dead and he proclaims victory, gospel victory. And precisely who he proclaims that to, precisely what does the realm of the dead look like? Um, I think we can get reasonably good answers for that too from scripture. But, but the point is, he does it between his death and his resurrection. And he says, I'm the Messiah and I'm the victorious one. Mm. And, yeah. Anything to add, Matt? Uh, not, not particularly. Like I, I'm kind of still a little like agnostic on where I would land, uh, which is the nice part about not preaching a passage is you don't <laughs> have to decide. You, you get some time. Um, but I, I do think that, uh, the idea that Jesus goes and proclaims victory to whatever spirits, whatever powers, that whole passage ends with the idea of Jesus's victory over angels, authorities, powers that they've been subjected to him. And so I, I do think that whatever the case is, like it's clear, the, the clear thing that he's trying to teach us is that Jesus, through his one death, his once and for all death, that one experience of suffering, great suffering, secures for him eternal victory eternal yeah. victory or all all things mm -hmm. uh whether powers or principalities or spirits or, or what have you right mm -hmm. uh, so yeah so notice the, the movement in the passage because it's told us earlier in the part of the section that's so concrete and applicational for us um, you're suffering you might suffer for doing good if you suffer for doing good here's the way to keep living in a way that testifies to the gospel and by word and deed and no matter your view, it's yeah. Jesus doing the same thing. Yeah. We're following his footsteps. He suffers and uh, he, he's a proclaimer of gospel victory, word and deed. And even if you say he's doing that through Noah, you're saying there even his Noah's suffering as a righteous one among an unrighteous world and just so few people and all the things that uh, the, the Christians in Asia Minor would have been feeling and experiencing. 
uh, again, he's saying, yes, but still, uh, we follow in the footsteps, which is to proclaim gospel in, in the setting we're in and in this way that's fitting for the people of Christ. Yeah. So it's interesting that you've mentioned, uh, which is in the text, Noah in verse 20. It's, it's interesting to me that Peter references Noah here, and I think he references Noah elsewhere in his letters. Uh, it's almost like Noah is his favorite character from the Old Testament. Peter just keeps going back to the same guy. He must have just love the stories of Noah. Can you talk more about why Noah's here? Yeah. Why not yeah. Abraham? Why not Moses? Why not someone else that's a famous patriarch of the church of the ancient people of God? Yeah. You got it. You have to ask that question, don't you? Right. Yeah. Because you say, yeah, it's it's here in our text clearly. It actually there's I think a very subtle hint, but I think probably a hint when he says in chapter four, uh, people think it's strange that you don't join with them in the same flood of dissipation, this mm. idea of flood being attached to sinful behavior. Mm. I think that's a subtle, subtle, just little tip of the hat yeah. to Noah. And then it shows up again in first or in second Peter a couple of times. And so wh why does Peter so love Noah? Uh, I think on one hand, we could say uh, the, the terrible fallenness of humanity and uh, of spiritual realities and all those things, all of that time, that there's something that he sees parallels in. This is a really significant moment yeah. of sinfulness and judgment and urgency. And, and so he's drawing those parallels. And that it's like eight people. Yeah. And the whole world and eight people, right? Like yeah. the, the drastic uh, difference between the Christians in Asia Minor and the whole world. Yeah, they feel like that there's very few of them, yeah. perhaps. But yeah, he's like, there's just eight there. That's yeah. true. That's true. So I, I think that's got to be a big part of it. Um, I, I think there's something maybe more. that This is a, a little speculative, so bear with me. But archaeology sometimes mm -hmm. helps us make sense of, of what the Bible's saying. And uh, one thing I discovered is we have found ancient coins, Roman coins from Asia Minor. And get this, uh, from after the time of Peter, but within a couple hundred centuries kind of thing. So it's, it's this similar culture still. Asia Minor, so the same geographic area this letter is written to these people. On these coins has Caesar's picture uh, stamped and scribed on one side and Noah's on the other Mm. And like I, I've seen a picture of one of these coins and there's this guy standing in this box like thing with his wife by his side and these little lappy waves at the bottom of the box and Noah, N-O-A, written across the bottom mm. in Greek. And uh, so um, and th th they've discovered a number of these coins. What on earth are they doing with coins with <laughs> Noah and the Ark in Asia Minor thousands of years after? Uh, Roman coins. Yeah. Right? This doesn't seem to make sense, but right. somehow then archaeology seems to say something happened very significant to the people in Asia Minor that Noah became a, a character, not just to the believers, mm. but to all the people. Mm. And to the believers, he would have been a bit of a folk hero, perhaps, to, uh, to, to the unbelievers. To the believers, he would be the biblical character, the real man we know of, that God chose and God used in, in this way. So, if this is, as we're putting this together, you say, okay, if the people then like all knew about Noah and he's this important figure in their culture and uh, it would make perfect sense for Peter to play off of things then that they're familiar with and to say, look, you know about this, you know about this, this is what happened at this time. And, or when he's talking about the coming judgment and, and you know, the, the, the elements are going to dissolve, like burn with fire, but they, they've been swept away in this flood. Mm -hmm. See, we know this, you know this story, like this is our God, and he will bring judgment on a sinful world, and this is our God, like he proclaims victory to mm. this fallen world, and and uh, mm. so th that just helps me a bit to say, okay, we can see textually some reasons why, I know that we're now going beyond the scriptures, but we can go, oh, and that might make good sense too, the things we understand. It's almost like maybe the way Jesus in his parables brings in culturally ap applicable uh, motifs, right? And maybe Peter's doing exactly the same here. Yeah. Could yeah. be something that was more appropriate in his day. We don't really understand it as much now, 2000 years hence, but mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, if anybody's interested, take the trip down to Lexington, Kentucky to the Ark Encounter. It's a great spot to go. It might open your mind to what could have happened in the days of Noah. It's beautiful. I know, Matt, you've been there too. Yeah. Yeah.
It's a good trip. Good trip. Hey, third question. It's the same verse. There's all kinds of things in the same verse 20. Let me read it one more time. To those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. Wow, there's a big question here. We got to tackle it. What does that phrase saved through baptism mean? Is this baptismal regeneration? Because I know as a Baptist church, that's not what we're about. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's helpful in this text, like Josh is saying, like just take what is plain and clear. So he's talking about Noah being saved through water. We've already talked about how that's sort of used like illustratively, almost like a parable, like you're saying, illustratively, saved through water. Then he moves to baptism, which corresponds to that metaphor. Baptism now saves you. And then he he almost comes in and as though he's sort of like concerned that we're going to do what you just said, uh, he says, not as a removal of dirt, not as a removal of dirt. And so he he helps us because he he sort of wards off this idea that the water itself is like the cleansing agent as though our minds are supposed to run to that idea as being what he's talking about. So he's using the metaphor of water through the flood, moves to baptism, which saves you and says, not as a removal of dirt. And so whatever we're to understand baptism being, we're to remember that it's, it might not be the actual like water baptism alone that he's mm. referring to. Mm. Uh, so it's helped me with this uh, being who I am is uh, we're almost 1700 years. Next year will be the 1700 year since uh, the Council of Nicaea, uh, which in the Nicene Creed, which perhaps all Christians ought to confess, uh, it has a line in it that says, and we believe in baptism for the remission of sins. Hmm. And for us, we're going to say, like, how does that what? not baptismal regeneration? Right. Baptism for the remission of sins. And uh, some time ago, I read a book by Sam Fowler called More Than a Symbol. And in it, he discusses this particular uh, passage. And he talks about how baptism here, probably in the same way that maybe is being done in Romans 6, baptism here is probably being used as like a, syne a synecdoche where we're thinking of the part for the whole. So he's speaking of baptism. There's more than just water baptism, right? There's spirit baptism. There's the whole salvation process, which is our being united with Christ in his death and in his resurrection. We receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then we symbolically show that through the symbol of water baptism. That whole process, uh, Fowler, uh, Dr. Fowler thinks, is what Peter is talking about here. Not just water baptism, baptism mm. by water included, but the entire process of us being united with Christ in his death, the old self dying, being raised to new life, receiving the Holy Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then outwardly showing that that interior reality is true by confirming that through water baptism. Hmm. That's well said. And in fact, we could take, I'm not sure if someone said this already, but we could bring forward the same idea that what really saved Noah and his family back in Genesis? It was God. God was yep. their savior. Yeah. Of course, they were on the water for a hundred and whatever days, but or three hundred days, whatever it was. But God was the savior, and it's the same today, right? The water is not the savior. The Lord is the savior. Yeah. Um, we trust in Him. Even in what you're saying, uh, it's important to remember that the the flood, the flood waters, save Noah in the same way that the water saves us it's it's correspondence right mm. the same waters that absolutely wipe out human and animal life on earth become his salvation uh because of the the saving method that god leads noah to which is the ark and in the same way you and i are saved through the saving method that god introduces to us the same water that would be death to us our sins, our old self, would be death to us hmm. through the saving method of the cross. Uh, God brings new life for us. We can be made. We can be made alive in spirit with Christ, hmm. uh, the same way that this text speaks of. That, that gets particularly important when you realize that 
Peter writes, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, yeah. who's gone into heaven and is at God's right hand. So right. Uh, it, it makes no sense to say the water saved Noah. Right. It's the, the water would have killed Noah. It's the yeah. whole of the thing. But the water is this picture. So this part being referenced of yeah. the whole, as Matt described, and and the whole is God's plan of salvation, him being in the ark, we being in Christ, God's whole plan of salvation, saving us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I love the way that's said. Thank you for making that clear to us, something that is initially maybe not clear. So um, that's awesome. Can I just end our time? Or do you have something else to add, Josh? I'd like just point out one more thing, by the way. Sure. Um, what in case somebody's like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. You know, it seems to say the baptism saves us, and, yeah. and I think you got to be baptized again. Okay, let's go by what's abundantly clear, and and we'll go to broader Good. scripture. So Ephesians two, it is by grace we are saved through, through faith. faith, yeah, not by works. Mm-hmm. Right. Baptism is a work; it is something we do. So if baptism in itself was the salvific thing the 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 like going into the water and being raised out of the water is the mechanism that we were saved by that would undo ephesians 2 and all the rest of those clear places in scripture that say no no no, this is god's grace it's done by faith mm-hmm. do something to earn your salvation mm-hmm. that we can't contradict the rest of that so whatever this means has to fit with that and and the explanation matt's offered fits with that mm-hmm Mm-hmm. By the way, we have baptisms coming this very Sunday. We sure did. So we will see some people. What's that? A bunch of them, I think. Yeah, right? okay. Oh. We will see some people and hear people telling that story once again. The gospel lived out through the, the water motif. Uh, it's going to be amazing. Yeah. Hey, let me leave us today with a couple of verses, which I think put a little bow on our topic here of what God has done for us in Christ which we cannot do for ourselves. It's back in the same text in verse 18 and 19. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. So there it is right there. Jesus suffered for me, for you. He did it for us to bring us to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. I love that phrase right there because that's also what we are going to go through someday. Probably we will be put to death in the body likely most of us unless the lord comes back first we will die physically our body will die but what happens then we'll be made alive in the spirit in that moment and so there's the story of salvation even in uh, in what christ has done and how we are walking with him so thank you guys for helping unpack some of these difficult passages in first peter 3 enjoy your conference and we'll see you back here in a few days and the rest of us God bless you. Uh, Walk with him today. We'll see you next week on the podcast. God bless.